questions or concerns that needs to be addressed from what we did last week. Last week, we, we began by introducing what neonatal jaundice is. And then we looked at the types of the neonatal jaundice. So before we add any new information, I want to know if you have any concerns. Okay. Hello. Hi, madam. Yes, I want to know if you have any concerns. There was something we said you didn't understand. You want us to explain it better. Do I take the silence to mean that we are all on the same page? We understand whatever we introduced last week. Oh, I want to hear one or two comments from you before I continue. I've asked several questions. Oh, yeah, okay. Concerning... Okay. So if we are fine, then I think we are good to go. Good. So last week, we talked about the fact that high levels of bilirubin in the blood of the new can be as a result of an underlying disease or the normal breakdown of red blood cells. And so that brings us to the types of neonatal jaundice. The first one we'll look at is pathologic jaundice. And of course, in talking about pathologic jaundice, then it means that we are looking at the newborn baby or the neonate having high levels of bilirubin as a result of an underlying disease condition. High levels of bilirubin in the blood of the newborn as a result of an underlying disease condition. And the most commonest we talk about here are diseases or, or abnormalities of the red blood cells in it. So conditions or abnormalities of the red blood cells itself. So for example, when we talk about ABO resource incompatibility, possible causes of pathologic jaundice. But for pathologic jaundice, what happens here is that the jaundice, that is the yellowish discoloration of the mucous membrane. Talk about the skin, the sclera, the often happens within 24 hours Birth. So within the first way to to realize that the newborn can become jaundice. And in this type of bilirubin levels rises very fast. And we can appreciate that it rises very fast because it is coming as a result of and usually or often all pathologic jaundice need management where we have to admit the newborn or the neonates into the neonatal intensive care unit and then some treatment in the form of phototherapy, in the form of exchange transfusion given to the baby to correct the high levels of bilirubin. Now, for some possible causes of pathologic jaundice, we can make mention of Increase breakdown of red blood. Where do we have blood group resource factor incompatibilities? Red blood cell enzyme defects such as G6PD. We can structural abnormalities of the red blood cells. As in the form of sickle cell disease. Then when we have sequestrated blood, so situations which may have lematoma, because at the end of the day, the, or the blood that has been collected will have to be broken down, and then that can lead to increase, increase in the bilirubin levels. Then prematurity, you know, when you talk about prematurity, the fact that the newborn baby is not matured and has come out of the womb, 
it means that most structures of especially here the liver in it helping the unconjugated to become conjugated may become problematic and so you find out that premature babies are at high risk developing pathologic jaundice then we'll come and look at the physiologic jaundice are the ABO incompatibilities later. Let's look at the physiologic jaundice. The physiologic jaundice usually is a form of hyperbilirubinemia, levels of bilirubin in the neonate's blood. But this is usually normal physiological processes. So normal processes of the body, of course, as the baby is born, the fetal red blood cells will have to be broken down to give way for the adults or the red blood cells, which are useful outside utero to And as this is being broken down, it sometimes puts new pressure on the liver to conjugate unconjugated bilirubin. And this can lead to the jaundice. But like I said, this is usually as a result of normal physical in the body. So most of the time, it doesn't need any kind of attention because it's physiologic. It's physiologic, normal processes of the body. And it does not usually need treatment unless you take serum bilirubin levels and realize that they are quite high. Then the baby may need admission. Other than that, physiologic jaundice does not need any special attention. And unlike the pathologic jaundice, where the cares within 24 hours after birth, in physiologic jaundice, because it is normal physiological process of the body, it is usually seen late. So sometimes you can see it on the second or on the third day of two weeks. You realize that the child is no longer jaundice. The jaundice fades away. So what we usually study encourages that we encourage the mother to continue to breastfeed because it's also shown that babies who are not well breastfed and tend to become dehydrated stand a higher risk of developing physiologic jaundice. So most of the time we encourage the mother to continue to breastfeed and then you realize that the jaundice result. Good. Now, I want us to quickly look at the pathophysiology of neonatal jaundice. The pathophysiology briefly, and then, then we can go on. Good. So, you know, like I have said, as the baby, the baby in the mother's uterus was using what you call the fetal red blood cells. Because the fetal red blood cells do not contain certain key elements. That are needed. That are needed inside. That are needed outside the. But as the baby is born, the baby, the baby will have to break down those fetal red blood cells quickly, produce new red blood cells that will be useful in carrying oxygen to all parts of the body. Now, in doing this, in doing this, it is the responsibility of the liver and then the reticular endothelial system break down the fetal red blood cells, then it is sent to the liver for the liver to be saved in the common gall or in the, com in the gall bladder. Now, in this process of hemolysis or breakdown of the fetal red blood cells, we know that in the breakdown of red blood cells, the hem parts of red blood cells are always stored. And then the globulin, which is the protein, is converted to bilirubin. Now, when the... Oh. Hello. Hi. Yes. Can anyone hear me, please? Like, yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm. Issues of. Yeah. 
Please, what what was the last word you heard me say? Or what was the last sentence you heard me say? Deliver. What Adam, was the last word or sentence you heard me say? The hem and the globin. <laughs> Where the hem okay. is not a so on focus, but the globin is what turns into the globin. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So when red blood cells break down, the hem part, that is, you know, we have hemoglobin. Hem part is saved, that is the ion, and then the globulin part, which is the protein, is converted to bilirubin. Bilirubin in the biliary system is converted to bile. But before it is converted to bile, it first becomes unconjugated. Then later, the bilirubin becomes conjugated for easy excretion. And when we talk about neonatal jaundice, this is where you have an imbalance. Imbalance between the breakdown of red blood cells, its conversion in the liver, and then its excretion. So if you have excessive breakdown of red blood cells, compared to the rate at which the bilirubin is excreted, then you can have the bilirubin being collected or being staying in the blood, leading to the jaundice. So when red blood cells are broken down, bilirubin is bound serum albumin, and then it is transferred to the liver where it is converted to bilirubin. Now, conjugated bilirubin is simply excreted in bile. And then you realize that it is also finds itself in the urine and then in the stools because it's discharged into the urinary system and then that of the JIT. Unfortunately, unconjugated bilirubin is fat soluble. And so it is not easy. That is why unconjugated bilirubin should always be converted to conjugated bilirubin before it is excreted. But there are some issues of these mechanisms then you may find high levels of bilirubin in the blood. And most of, especially, we are looking at unconjugated bilirubin. And that gives the skin and the mucous membrane of the newborn to become, which we term as jaundice. Now, for a child to be diagnosed of neonatal jaundice, depends on the levels of serum bilirubin, we identify from a blood sample. So when a blood sample is taken to the investigation to go and measure the total serum bilirubin levels, then we'll look out for the levels of this bilirubin. Normally, of course, there should be some few elements of bilirubin in blood. So if a unit has a bilirubin of 0 0.2 milligrams per deciliter of blood to 1.5 milligrams per deciliter of blood, we assume that to and that does not even put the baby in any kind of, you know, jaundice, whether pathologic or physiologic. But as soon as we are having the bilirubin levels increase to more than two milligrams per deciliter, then we term that as a subclinical jaundice. So that is a situation that we have to be monitoring the serum levels. Baby is close to developing jaundice. And then we tend a unit to have neonatal jaundice or clinical jaundice when serum bilirubin levels are more than five milligrams per deciliter of blood. Then we tend that unit to have neonatal jaundice. And this is where management needs to be given so as to prevent complications that may arise from the high levels of bilirubin. Please, are you all together with me? Yes, madam. Good. So before we diagnose a neonate as having jaundice, it is always important that we measure the serum bilirubin levels. That will give us a good indication as the levels of bilirubin and then how to manage the baby. Good. So let's look at the diagnosis of neonatal jaundice. In fact, neonatal jaundice can be diagnosed when you see the yellow discoloration of the skin and mucous membrane. But again, it is not enough to just tell that the baby who is having 
the yellowish green is discoloration of the skin and mucous membrane is jaundice. We we'll need to do some laboratory investigations. So the first one we'll talk about is the serum or the total serum bilirubin levels. The total serum bilirubin levels. And under the total serum bilirubin levels, we we'll want to look at the levels of conjugated and then unconjugated bilirubin. Remember, I conjugated bilirubin is water soluble and so can easily be excreted. However, unconjugated bilirubin is lipid or fat soluble. And so it is quite difficult to be excreted. So when we do the total serum bilirubin levels, that is where we are looking at the levels of conjugated and unconjugated. The more we have unconjugated levels, that means that we need to put certain things in place to facilitate the unconjugated bilirubin to becoming conjugated for easy excretion. Sometimes we can also do some liver function tests. And why liver function tests? Why do you think we, we need to do a liver function test? Liver function test. I have asked the question, why a liver function test? Yes, Jesse. Hello, madam. Yes. Yes. Um, we all know that the liver has, has um, break down the, the globulin part of the hemoglobin into the blue vein, the uh, blue vein. And as such, when it breaks down, it's uh, unconjugated. It has to further break down to unconjugated blue. There is a need for us to check if the liver is the capacity to do that or not. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. There was a hand up in addition. Can I see that hand again? There was a hand up. Yes, Noah. What do you also want to say? Coffee. <laughs> yes, Musa. Yes, madam. I, I wanted to say that I wanted to say that it is the liver that mm. normal conflict. Yes, I wanted to say that it is the liver that normal uh, convert the unconjugated the little bit to the conjugated one. So in doing the liver function test, that one will be able to tell you, it will be, it will be able to determine whether the liver is having that uh, capability. Okay. okay. Or not. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So what Musa and Noah have said is exactly the correct answer. Yes, Esther, let me also hear you. Sister, yes. I was also thinking that it is the liver's function to help in the formation of the bowel. So if the liver is not functioning adequately, then there will be a buildup within the blood and it will result in the jaundice formation. Good. Excellent. Esther, thank you also very much. Excellent. So like they have all said, it is the function of the liver to, you know, go use processes to convert unconjugated to conjugated bilirubin. And so if the liver is diseased, if there are certain things wrong, then we should expect that this mechanism will be faulty. And so you find high levels of the bilirubin in blood. Then sometimes also we can do blood cultures because sepsis is also one of the major causes of pathologic jaundice. So we we'll do blood culture um, to rule out sepsis. Then we can also do urine microscopy or cultures. And, uh, you know, urine, uh, urinary tract infections can also cause sepsis. Then we can do several blood tests. Example, like we can do the ABO resource factors. We can do a, a hemoglobin electrophoresis. We can also do full blood count to look out for the level of hemoglobin and then the PAC cell volume. 
So we can do these things all in an effort to rule out what could possibly be wrong. Remember when I was talking about pathologic jaundice, I said APO resource impactabilities are one of the causes of pathologic jaundice. Then I talked about some diseases of the red blood cells like um, sickle cell disease. They want to do HB or hemoglobin electrophoresis to identify if the baby has sickling no, whether it is SS, SD, or what, because all these things can contribute to the development of pathologic jaundice. Good. Now let's look at the treatments. Treatment is all about clearing the bilirubin from the blood or we do, uh, making the bilirubin be excreted from the body so as to reduce this. And we can do that in so many ways. But first, we'll talk about hydration and then breastfeeding. Remember when I was talking about physiologic jaundice, I said some physiologic jaundice come about as a result of inadequate feeding, which leads to the baby becoming dehydrated. And so we'll encourage intake of breastfeeding or we, we may we'll encourage the intake of breast milk or encourage the mother to continue to breastfeed to hydrate the baby. Or sometimes... We may also give parenteral fluids so as to kind of flush the system of the bilirubin. You know, the more the kidneys put in fluids, the more they will be able to of the bilirubin and reduce the levels. If all this then we may put the baby under phototherapy. That is where we use its light. Usually a light, which is made up of two colors, blue and white, expose the baby's skin to the light. And it is the work of the ultraviolet light or the ultraviolet rays to kind of convert the unconjugated bilirubin to conjugated bilirubin from an easy excretion. So for phototherapy, you see that we put the baby in the, in the court with the photo light. And then we, we expose all parts of the body except the eyes and then the genital area, especially in the male child. This is because as the baby lies under the photo or under the light, constant exposure of the light eye has been found to cause certain eye conditions and even blindness later on in life. And then again, you know, since it is a photo, it will definitely produce some amount of heat. And if you expose the male child's scrotum, where the testes are, the exposure to the heat can cause some damage as early the, the neonatal period cause damage to the test, which can lead to future sterility or infertility in that particular man as a result of the therapy. So we expose all parts of the body except the genital area and then the eye. Any question? Any question? Okay. Now, if you are a nurse, hello, and you have madam. A and a photo. Yes. Yes. Please um, let me hear you. Please. When you were talking about the normal levels of bilirubin in the body, after you explained the first two, I didn't get the last one, the subclinical jaundice, which is greater than two milligrams. Please, can you explain that again? Is treatments given to that or not? Okay. So, you know, in the subclinical, we cannot say you are clinically positive for jaundice, but you may be in the process of developing jaundice. And in the health clinical, we can have the, the baby who has physiologic jaundice having a serum bilirubin level of about two or even a little more than two. Those ones, we still have to be on our guard, continue to monitor the serum bilirubin. But as soon as the bilirubin level gets to five, then this child definitely needs treatment. So with a subclinical, it's like you are not clinically diagnosed as having 
neonatal jaundice, just that we have to be very vigilant and observant. So this one, we can encourage the mother to continue to breastfeed. As the mother breastfeeds, the child becomes high, uh, well hydrated and is passing volumes of urine. It's an, a way that the system will, will flush the excess bilirubin and then reduce the levels of bilirubin in blood. As soon as it gets to five or even more, then this is where the baby will need treatment. Please have I answered you. Okay, madam, thank you. Thank you too. So the phototherapy, I've said, this is where we expose the baby's skin to the ultraviolet rays from a special light, said bilirubin, for easy expression by the kidneys. And I have just said that as nurses at the NICU, or even parents who come to our baby's bedside at the NICU, it is important that we shield the eye of the baby and not only the eye, but also that of the genitals, so that there won't be excessive exposure of the light, which produces some heat to these things and cause future damages to the baby's eye and then to the baby's reproductive system, especially in the male child. Are we together on that? Are we together yes, on that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma that is about the phototherapy. Sometimes, however, the phototherapy may not be enough in very extreme or very high levels of cerebellarubin. It may become necessary that we even bypass phototherapy and then we put the baby through what we call exchange transfusion. Exchange transfusion. So in exchange transfusion, this is where some amount of the baby's blood is removed. And then blood, which we, let me say, are healthy or is healthy, does not contain the bilirubin. Or some of those elements that may cause high bilirubin levels like sickle cell disease is removed. And then healthy blood is infused into the baby in an effort to reduce the excessive breakdown red blood cells, which is causing high levels of bilirubin. Let me take it again. I said in exchange transfusion, this is where you realize that the baby's blood, some amount of the baby's blood, which may be diseased and is causing high levels of bilirubin, is removed. And then healthy blood, which does not contain some of these elements like sickle cell disease, or any other thing that we identified as causing the high levels of bilirubin is infused into the baby in an effort to reduce excessive breakdown of the red blood cells. So that is where we talked about exchange transfusion. And exchange transfusion can be done either using the one catheter or we can use the two catheter pool and so one catheter or two catheter pull and push the sleep. So with a one catheter, you use one catheter where you withdraw the blood from the baby and then also infuse some of the healthy blood outside into the baby. In the other one, we can talk about the fact that two catheters are used. One is withdrawing blood out, one is infusing blood out. So this is done and then takes care of the excessive breakdown of the red blood cells of the baby. Because you see, if the levels of bilirubin is not managed, bilirubin can travel to the brain and that can cause severe damage to the brain, leading to cases of subnormality, and learning disabilities, cognitive problems. You realize that how the baby will behave is different. The extent that some of them may even develop cerebral palsy. Some of them may even develop some disabilities, and that can be very difficult for the parents. But are you all here with me? Yes, ma. Yes, please. Yes, ma. Let's look at the nursing management. For the nursing management, 
I will begin by saying there is a need to really reassure the parents because every parent expects that when the baby is born, this baby should come home where they bond with the baby. But if it becomes that the baby is born and it's already jaundiced and needs to be admitted at the neonatal intensive care unit, it calls for a lot of worry, a lot of anxiety, because you don't know what is going to happen next. So it's important that it is important that we reassure the parents. And then it is also important that we monitor the serum bilirubin levels. It's very, very important because it's the serum bilirubin levels that influences the kind of treatments the units may receive. So if the, the, the values are very high, then we'll quickly think of exchange transfusion. But if it is not so high, it's a clinical journalist who will think of probably phototherapy. So it's important that we want it can be done on alternate days just to keep track of the, the levels of bilirubin. Then it is also important that we monitor vital signs. Vital vital signs, we take note of any deviation from the norm. If the baby begins to maybe or have seizures, it quickly tells us that some complications may have already set in. And then if the baby is in the phototherapy, I've told you about caring for the baby in the phototherapy, you use the eye shield, you cover the, the little area, and then you also continue to hydrate because the phototherapy produces some heat, which may withdraw some water out of the baby, making the baby to sometimes become dehydrated. We also encourage the mother to breastfeed. It's very important. So more the mother breastfeed, of course, the more the baby receives enough fluid and then also reduces the jaundice that may come about as a result of inadequate feeding. Yes, um, Amma. <clears throat> Sister, good afternoon. Good yes. Uh, my question is that normally when we are doing this phototherapy, we advise mothers that um, don't be going close to the uh, therapy machine. Allow the baby to be there for at least mostly four hours, three hours. So what time do we encourage the breastfeeding? Because we are telling the mothers that don't interrupt the therapy. So when do we encourage the more of the breastfeeding? Because normally we want them to spend more time under the therapy. Yeah, thank you very much. So you see, um, the baby cannot be under the phototherapy 24-7. There are times that we put off the photo and then encourage bonding and also encourage the mother to breastfeed. And so usually we leave the baby to lie in the cots under the photo. And then if there is a need to really attend to the baby, maybe the baby sleep for about one hour, two hours, and then the baby gets up and begins to cry. That is the time we can still, as we are trying to comfort the baby, maybe the diaper is soiled, trying to comfort the baby. It's the same time we can also use for the mother to breastfeed. Because usually if the baby is awake, it may be difficult to put the baby under the photo strictly without the baby, you know, agitated. Okay. Because sometimes you see that even though you want the baby to be under the photo for some period of time, the baby may be crying. And the baby cannot be crying. It will even be irritating you the next and the nickel. So any sh short time, that calls for the need for the baby to be attended to. That is where we can put in the breastfeeding. Sometimes even depending on the age of the baby, we may even allow the mother to express. And then as the baby is attended to quickly, you know, when babies are full, they do not cry. So that the baby can sleep, sleep for lengthy hours and then still be exposed to the photo. Please have I answered you. Yes, sister. Thank you. 
So for this baby, you can't just be picking this baby and, you know, just cosing the baby when there is no need. So when the need be, you bring the baby out of the photo. That is the time we can put in our breastfeeding. As the baby is asleep, can spend a lengthy time, we put the baby back under the photo. Good. Thank you very much. Any other question? Yes, Gloria. Yes, sister, please. Um, I want to add up to what you just said. In severe cases, we, the nurses, we encourage um, nasogastric or gastric tube feeding so that we will um, prevent long breastfeeding time. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, Lizzie. Okay, I'm also adding up and making the baby feel like mother feeding three hourly. I think it's also good. Two to three hour feeding is also okay. The baby feels well. The baby can sleep under the phototherapy for a long time before carrying the baby again. Very much. I do have. Thank you. Musa. Uh, yes, madam, please. The, the ancient transfusion. Uh, how, how many times is it carried out in a child's lifetime? Oh, it all depends on the levels of the delivery bed, when we measure it. It all depends on the levels. So, but maybe a maximum of twice. You see, it. I told I, I started by saying that. The total serum belly levels influences the kind of treatment. If we see some yellowish no. greenish discoloration, but the level do is around two or something, then we'll continue to monitor. But as soon as the levels no. hit five, or even very close to five, in some doctors, they will just do to ask for treatment. Okay. So it is the levels because we'll, we'll look at some of the complications. When the belly levels are very high, okay. It can cause damage to the brain. And so to avert some of these things, we quickly will not even begin with phototherapy, but straight away to exchange transfusion. We do the exchange transfusion, the levels come down a little bit, but of course, that's not come back to normal. Then we can put the baby under photo so that it can reduce further. So the exchange transfusion is all dependent on the levels of the bilirubin. It is not in all neonatal jaundice babies who need exchange transfusion. It depends on the serum bilirubin level. Musa, have I answered you? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank yes. you very much. Yes, Francis. Yeah. Okay, madam, thank you, for, thank you for the presentation. Madam, please, um, what I want to ask is, if the baby is being breastfed for maybe three hours, can you, can you agree the, the baby to, like, when the baby is on phototherapy? I'm asking whether if the baby is on phototherapy, are you supposed to put on a uh, trans uh, infusion as the, the mother is being yeah. as the mother as the mother is being breastfed uh, breastfeeding, breastfeeding the baby? Yes, as the baby is under the phototherapy. Remember, okay. I said the phototherapy produces some amount of heat. So sometimes, even if you do not hydrate the baby enough, you realize that the baby is becoming dehydrated. So as the baby is under the phototherapy, for hydration, we most of the time continue to hydrate in the form of parenteral fluids. But you see, a mother cannot breastfeed a baby continuously for three hours. And you know, the neonates are such that as soon as you begin to breastfeed and they are a bit full, they will sleep off. So as soon as, so the mother can just breastfeed a baby for 20 minutes and this baby will sleep. Then we put the baby back, still having the cannula in situ with the IV fluids for hydration. Okay. But we want the baby most of the day under the photo. Are, are you with me? Okay. Thank you, madam. Because even, yeah, you are welcome. Even if the baby is not being breastfed, we will have to clean the baby. We may have to change the diaper. And some of these things, you may bring the baby out of the, the court. Okay. So for the breastfeeding, you know, three hours continuous. The baby cries for attention. Then the baby back. Oh, good. So let's please continue. 
I think I want, I, this time want us to look at the complications. So the first complication we'll talk about here is what we call connectoros. Connectoros. Connectoros is simply a situation where we have so high levels of bilirubin such that this bilirubin travels to the brain and then causes damage to the brain tissues. The levels of, of bilirubin become so high then the bilirubin travels to the brain and causes damage to the brain tissues. And you know, the brain tissues are such that when they are damaged, it becomes very hard to, you know, rejuvenate them or bring them back to life again. So in this connective, it can lead to the baby developing cerebral palsy. It can lead to damage to certain vital centers of the brain, which can affect the hearing um, sight. It can even affect problems leading to their baby developing eye problems, can even cause the baby to have seizure disorders later in life. And then it can even lead to poor development or even poor dental development. And now all these things are some complications that, are, that can arise. The most common complications we talk about is the connectors leading to cerebral palsy, leading to seizure disorders. And then sometimes the child may even grow up having personality disorders. You see their behavior is quite weird. It's odd than we normally expect from any normal person. Good. Any other, any question? Any question? Any question, please? Do I take it that we are on the same page? Yes, madam. And yes, madam. Okay. So, next thing I want us to talk about is ABO resource incompatibility. ABO resource incompatibility. This is one of the major causes of neonatal jaundice. ABO resource incompatibility. You know, there are several blood groups. We can have blood group A, blood group B, blood group AB, and then blood group O. Now, on all these blood groups, there are some proteins which either makes you either resource negative or resource positive. So you can be A and we say A positive or A negative. You can be B, you can be positive or negative. You can be A, B, either negative or positive. So can you be O and you can still be either positive or negative. This resource factor is a very vital rule when it comes to sometimes the development of jaundice. And fortunately or unfortunately, it happens when the mother is resource negative and then the baby is resource positive. And you know, most babies take after their father's blood group and their resource factors. So usually if a mother is negative, A, B negative, O negative, A negative, B negative, the fact that she has a resource negative factor and then she is impregnated by a man who has a resource positive factor. Sometimes it can bring issues leading to pathologic jaundice. Now, this is what happens. So a woman who is resource negative get pregnant by a man who is resource positive. And like I say, I'm saying that most babies take after father's blood group and then the resource factor. So in their first pregnancy, the woman who is resource negative carries a baby who is resource positive. Usually, in the first pregnancy, nothing happens. But during the birth of this baby, you know, in birth, there is a high possibility of some exchange of blood between the mother and the baby. So this mother or this mother who has a resource negative delivers a baby who is resource positive and in the delivery process, some exchange of blood takes place. So the baby's resource factor, resource positive factor blood may find its way in the mother's circulation, maybe during the detachment of the placenta, whatever, may find itself in 
the mother's circulation. As soon as this blood, which is resource positive, finds itself in the mother's circulation, what happens here is that the mother's resource negative blood sees the resource positive as a foreigner, terrorist, as a danger, and so develops antibodies against the resource positive factor, which may have found itself in the resource negative blood as a result of the delivery process. So antibodies are formed. And these antibodies we know are formed specifically against the resource positive factor. So what happens here is that if the woman gets pregnant with another baby, and then this baby also decides to take after the father's resource positive factor, the antibodies which have been formed in the earlier pregnancy or in the first pregnancy in a response to the resource positive factor which entered the mother's now see the baby who has a resource positive factor as a terrorist and so begins to harm it, begins, begins to damage it. And so you realize that the baby now begins to have excessive breakdown of red blood cells because of these antibodies which were formed in their mother's circulation. So this baby may be born jaundiced or this baby may not even survive. And so you realize there are some women who will tell you that after my first pregnancy, whichever baby I have maybe ends up in a miscarriage or aborted. It may be some of these things. So the mother's resource negative factor sees who is also resource positive as a terrorist and begin to fight it, leading to sometimes the baby being born jaundiced. And when the baby is born jaundiced can lead to some of these complications we have said, we have talked about. The connectors, the cerebral palsy, the seizure disorders, or the baby may not even be able to grow to 10. And then the baby may be aborted in the process of the pregnancy. And so to avert this, to avert this, we give what we call immuno immunoglobulin D, or what people call anti immunoglobulin D. And depending on the physician, some physicians begin to give the drug even during the antenatal period at a certain period of pregnancy, maybe at the 20th week, 28th week, and then the last dose may be given you after delivery. Some they also wait that the delivery of the baby within a maximum of 48 hours, the mother should be given the anti D. And what this immunoglobulin D or this anti D does is that it prevents the mother's resource negative blood from developing antibodies against the resource positive blood. Should there be any exchange during the delivery, whether it is a normal vaginal delivery or even cesarean section? So just prevents the mother's resource negative blood from developing antibodies, which if care is not taken, may affect an innocent baby who may be um, carried during the next pregnancy. Class, are you here with me? Yes, yes. madam. Yes, madam. Good. So that is. APO resource incompatibility, one of the major causes of uh, pathologic jaundice in the newborn baby. Okay. And I've said how it comes about a mother being resource negative, impregnated by a man who is resource positive. The baby takes after the resource positive factor. If the baby takes after the mother's resource negative factor there is there is no problem at all because the baby's resource negative factor is the same as that of the mother and so the mother's resource negative will okay so to prevent it we give the immunoglobulin d or what people call anti d or some people even call it rogam it's just to prevent the mother's you know blood developing antibodies against the resource positive factor. Good. Any question? Any question? Hello. Any question, please?
Hello, sister. Okay. Yes. Sister. Elizabeth. Yes. I'm still not getting how yes. the resource factor in and the resource factor incompatibility causes the jaundice. So what I'm saying here is that a woman who is negative is impregnated by a man who is resource positive. And most babies take after their father's blood group and resource factor. So let's look at it as the baby takes after the father's resource factor. So the mother is like, baby saying that during delivery, whether cesarean section or even vaginal delivery, the possibility of blood mix up between the mother's resource negative and that of the baby's resource positive is very high. So if the mother gets some of the resource positive blood of the baby into her circulation, you see, there are two different resource factors. We have resource positive and resource negative. And so the resource positive blood of the baby, which has entered the mother's circulation, now the mother's negative resource factor sees the positive as a foreigner, a terrorist, someone that is not like us. And so begin to form antibodies against the resource positive blood which entered the mother's circulation. So antibodies are now prepared, developed. So when the woman gets pregnant again, it can be with the same man or even with a different man. The fact that that baby in utero is also resource positive. Those antibodies which were formed after the first baby was born and then some blood entered the mother will now begin to fight because it's like soldiers have been prepared or have been trained against this particular terrorist. So now they see another resource positive and they see it as something which is foreign. And then they begin to fight it. Now, as they fight it, they cause or it leads to what we call a breakdown or hemolysis of the fetal red blood cells. So the fetal red blood cells break. And then that already makes the baby jaundice in utero. Or the baby may become so jaundiced to the extent that the baby may even die. Please, are, are, are you understanding me? Or the yes, baby may be dying, you know, go to So this is where the baby may be born already jaundice. And if a baby is born already jaundice, then it's straight away pathologic jaundice. So as a result of an underlying disease condition, what we are looking at, resource incompatibility. So that happens and then realize that baby has high levels of the little bit, which leads to the baby developing some of these connectors and all that, and then you can have the the complications. We come, we talked about cerebral palsy and all that. Okay, but I'm saying that when the baby is raised snake, it doesn't bring much of problem because the baby's results is the same as that of the mother. We begin to have an issue when and the baby is positive. So that is why whenever you visit the antenatal clinic for the very first time, you will have to be screened for blood grouping and the risk factor because of some of these things. And if you are resource negative, usually you are always encouraged to bring in your partner. So your partner the blood group and resource factor to see if your partner is also negative as you are, we don't have any problem. But the problem is when your partner is positive and you are negative, then it becomes a situation for attention. And then we need to put things in place to prevent your body developing antibodies so as to affect the next baby. Let me quickly look to the chat. Someone is asking, please, madam, what happens if the woman is resource positive and the man is resource negative. Okay. 
<laughs> those ones, brother, does not bring much of an issue. Father, the man is positive, usually leads to this problem. And then another one says that because the mother is resource factor is negative, the baby is resource positive, which the baby inherited from the father. The mother's blood sees the baby as a foreigner because the resource incompatibility is. Just like you can give a positive blood to a negative blood during blood transfusion. Okay, okay. I think I didn't get everything, but like you were saying, because of the incompatibility, negative is not compatible with positive. So because of that, you have the incompatibility occurring and then the jaundice also occurs. So you see, even as nurses, when we are going to transfuse blood, we just don't look at the blood grouping, but we are also always concerned about the resource factor. Because if someone is blood group O, hello. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. I went off yes, again. So I wanted to know if you had any questions on the resource incompatibility and even the whole of the neonatal jaundice we've talked about. Any question? Any question, please? Does anyone has a question? Let me look into the chats. Does anyone has a question? Do I take the, the silence that there are no questions? No one has any issue. Please, madam. Yes. Yeah. Uh, please, I want to know whether if the if there is something like what we are saying about the results negative and uh, then the end positive. I I want to know the injection that they will give. Is it expensive? The uh, the Agrotinin D. Is it expensive? It's very expensive. But I don't know how expensive it is. Very expensive. Uh, but I don't and, know how expensive it is. And you know, it should be kept just like the insulin. It should be kept cold. So usually when you see, and it is not one of the usual drugs the hospitals will purchase kept in the pharmacy. And because I don't you know, know at what point this. It just goes bad. Please, please let me land. And okay. if no one purchases, it goes bad and it becomes a cost to the hospital. So usually when these things are identified, then you can make arrangements quickly with maybe pharmacists who may also liaise with someone and get it available so that when you deliver, it can be given to you within the first seven to two hours after birth. Because the longer you do not take the injection, then you give the, the, the system the ability to develop the antibodies and that can go against it. So in the chats, people are writing 3,000 to 4,000. Someone says 700 to 800. Someone has also made mention of um, 1,200 cities. So like I said, I know, I know it's expensive, but I don't know how expensive it is. Yeah. yeah. So it, it can be, it can be, and I, I, someone has even added, depending on your location, of course, and even depending on the, fa on the um, you know, the facility you are purchasing it, purchasing it from. Good. Musa, you wanted to also say something again before I come to give tea. Musa, finish up. Okay, let me take give tea. Madam, please, I would like to know if there is something to do if the mother has already, the uh, resource factor negative mother has already, the blood has already built so just against the positive yeah. blood. Can there be, which will help the mother to give birth is, if the husband is a positive blood group? So what usually happens sometimes, you can be given the anti D again, but in higher doses. It, the anti D 
again in higher doses over a period of time. Okay, but it's, it is not so much of even a guarantee that after the treatment, you know, you can have all the antibodies cleared up and then you can have the, the baby without any, any problem. So the best thing is to prevent the antibodies from being formed. Okay. So that's why we Thank use the NCD. But you see, this is, I've, I've ever had students ask questions that, so during premarital preparation, if I'm negative, my, my husband to be is positive, doesn't need that we have to, you know, call off whatever. There, there's no need for that. But it just calls yeah, for the fact that pregnancy and labor, you have to get this medication to prevent your system from developing the antibodies. But it, it is not like sickle cell disease where it's a genetic disorder which is passed on from parents to their offspring. And so over there, we need to be very careful about. This one does not call for any, you know, calling of the wedding or even the engagement. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Lydia. Uh, please, um, um, please, I ask because sometimes Hello. maybe... Yes, please let me hear. Someone... Good afternoon. I'm a victim. And as they are asking, before, uh, when you get pregnant for, uh, let's say, first trimester, that the first three months, and you are results negative, you will be given the short dose, uh, the anti D. Mm -hmm. For that one, insurance covers. Depending on the uh, oh, okay. Then, yeah, I was given the first one. Then when I was in six, two, I was given the second one. Then after delivery, mm -hmm. the third dose was given before breastfeeding the baby. Yeah. So okay. that's what I know. Okay. For my, but uh, for all but, the doses, was it covered by the National Health no, for the first one, only the first one. Oh, okay, okay. Only the Okay. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Thank you. Yes. I can see um, Lydia. Or is it Lydia who has just spoken? Thank you. Let me take um, Idrisu. Thank you, Madam. Uh, I want to find out whether is there a way of knowing the yeah. the uh, blood group in the so that they won't be need for. Please, please, please come again. Uh, please come again. I'm saying. Hello. Yes, your line was a bit bad. I was to like. Is there a way we can de 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 uh, determine the Fetus, the growing fetus in the throat bra group, so that we won't be given the probability of giving it before uh, it will trigger the mother immune system to produce. Okay. Uh, the okay. So Thanks. that can be done. I know in the advanced country, some of these investigations can be done, but they carry with it, they come with it with a lot of risk. You know, sometimes you 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 get into the uh, the amniotic fluid, and then it can even lead to amniotic embolism in the mother, and that can lead to death. So what we can do best is that, and uh, in in my facility where I delivered my babies, I'm also a victim, like someone said, she's a victim. So in that facility, usually as soon as I deliver the baby. We, we do the test, okay? We want to run the baby's blood group and resource and find out. So for one of the babies, I didn't take the immunoglobulin D because the baby was also negative as I was. So there wasn't any problem. So to avert some of these things, you know, to cut down costs and all that, in some facilities, they will test the baby's blood group. If the baby is positive, then definitely 
you have to take the anti D. But if the baby comes out negative like you are, there wouldn't be any need. Okay. And like I'm saying, some of these investigations during the intrauterine life comes with it with a lot of risk. Okay. Come with it with a lot of risk, um, like to the mother and sometimes even to the baby. So we can wait when the baby is born. We can run a quick investigation to find out what is the resource factor of the baby and then dependent if you need it or not, we will decide upon it. So this anti D, and thank you very much. What Ma has put in the chat, even when you are bought, this is not even um, the baby, not only when the baby is born at 10, even when there is a miscarriage or an abortion, the mother who is anti D with the husband who is, I'm um, sorry, the mother who is resource negative with the father who is resource positive, whatever it is, she needs to take the shots. Because in an abortion too, there can be that exchange of blood and the antibodies can be against the next baby. Okay, good. Someone say yes, the baby's blood may be resource factor positive. So would need it when you are bought here. Yeah, it's the same as I've just said. Thank you very much. Let me take a hand. I saw Steven's ear. Yeah, Steven, your hand uh -huh. is up. Yeah, so please, Fabi, I'm, I, I'm a bit confused about the resource factor. Is it is it the better factor? Is the positive, like let's say the old positive or, ne or negative? Is it the positive aspect we term as the resource factor, or we have a test for resource factor? Okay, so it is the O or the positive. So we oh. we just do not say you are O. Are you O positive or O negative? It is you being negative or positive that we term as the resource factor. Okay. So someone can have a resource positive or a resource negative factor. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yes, Ishmael. I want to ask, like, I'm also a little bit... Because the thing is, like, I don't know whether if, if the woman is uh, resource negative and then the man is resource positive and the woman has given birth, after giving birth, when they test the child and the child is uh, negative, meaning they will not give the uh, the, uh, the antigen T again, or? Yes, there's no need because the mother's resource factor is the same as that of the baby. The baby, Okay. Okay. It is when Thank the you. baby takes after the positive that becomes an issue. But when the baby is the okay. same as the mother, of course, negative, negative, they are the same. So there okay. wouldn't be any for you to see it as a foreigner or a threat and then you develop antibodies against it. Mm. But, but like, example, like my sister who just shared her own right now, I don't know whether, were they able to test the fetus to know whether the fetus to it was positive or negative and they started giving the first dose second dose and the third dose so i don't know good good yeah so you see when the anti d is given it doesn't it doesn't cause any harm the harm occurs when the positive blood gets into the negative blood system so like i said in facilities even when you have delivered they will check it before giving you the anti d in other facilities the fact that you are negative and your partner is positive. The, the shot is given. I told you that sometimes, even during pregnancy, there can be exchange of blood between the fetus and the mother when some of the placenta or when the, the, there is some deficiencies in the placenta. So in those situations, the ones given during the antenatal period will cover the woman. Okay, so... It, 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 in some facilities, it wouldn't be checked. In others, even when you have delivered, they want to check and be sure that the baby has a positive before it is given. Yes. Kwabna? Yeah, hey, madam, Kwabna. please. Uh, yeah, yes, please. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Uh, uh -huh. uh, please, uh, I too, I had that same challenge. By my own, uh, my doctor told me that uh, the first the, the first pregnancy that uh, the injection is needed, the antigen is needed. 
then after that one uh there will not be any injection for the lady again so the first one uh i bought uh, the antigen the antigen d then uh they injected her to 72 hours so you have to get the injection 72 hours after drilling so before delivery, uh, when that one is hey, okay after drilling we, we, okay within 72 hours after delivery yeah yeah. Yes, and the, the woman should get the injection to be injected. Yeah. So when I did that one, the second pregnancy, there wasn't need for the, the they did not ask me to buy it again. Then the child is alive and kicking. So I don't know either. Always we have to check uh, the child's uh, age, uh, blood group before or what the doctor told me that after the, the first one, there's no need for it again. Okay, well, for me, mm, what I know okay. is that after every pregnancy, so if the woman wants to even have 10 children, after each of them, she needs to take the antidote because if she does not take it, the next child, if it is positive, then it can go into the, the, the blood and then antibodies are formed. So the antidote, mm. what I know is that at every pregnancy, it is given to prevent the antibodies from being formed should the positive blood enter the woman the next pregnancy so that the next baby will not have any problem with incompatibility issues leading to jaundice. But for, for what you've just also asked, I'll ask another physician to find out. Okay. Probably okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Okay. So let's let's look at some infections in children. And the first one we'll look at is diphtheria followed by poliomyelitis. Now, diphtheria used to be one of the highly communicable diseases before the advent of vaccines. And it's it tends to kill lots of children. But these days, with the advent of vaccination. You know, if you look at our expanded program on immunization, we have vaccines against diphtheria. And so in most, um, let me say, um, low to middle income countries where infectious diseases was a burden to us some years ago, with the advent of vaccines, some of these cases, sometimes it's even become difficult to see some of them. Okay, so we'll talk about diphtheria. So diphtheria is a highly infectious disease and it is usually caused by the corny bacterium diphtheria the corny bacterium diphtheria and that is a gram positive bacillus okay corny bacterium diphtheria the mode of transmission is through droplets just like COVID-19 the mode of transmission is through droplets just like COVID-19 so if the baby or the child coughs, sneezes, spits, and then another person unfortunately uses the hand on these surfaces, gets into the eye, into the nostrils, then the organism develops straight into the respiratory tracts. Okay, so it's an acute bacterial infection of the upper respiratory tract, and in the upper respiratory tract, it can affect either the nasals, the tonsils, the pharynx, or even the larynx. But diphtheria can also affect the skin, what we term as the cutaneous diphtheria. And for the cutaneous diphtheria, most of the time, the mode of transmission is through, you know, contact with an infected person. Good. For the pathogenesis, how the disease comes about, I've told you that the disease spreads through droplets. So when an infected person coughs, spits, sometimes even talks by just talking, sneezing, spits, and then it gets into the eye, into the nostrils. If the, another person, an uninfected person, touches these surfaces and takes the hand into the eyes or the nose, it goes straight in the with an incubation period of two to five days. And then as it gets into the upper respiratory tract, now it leads to the discharge of 
some toxins we call the exotoxins. And these exotoxins causes necrosis of epithelial tissues in the respiratory tract. That leads to the development of a membrane. We'll look at the membrane very soon. Grayish whitish membrane, which usually forms on the tonsils. Then you find it in the facet of the upper respiratory tract. And when these things happen, sometimes it's the place can become so inflamed that respiration is a difficulty. Remember, I'm talking about um, disease or infection of the upper respiratory tract. And here we are having the pharynx, the larynx being involved. So it can lead to sometimes in and that is what usually may kill some of the children. Again, the exotoxins, which are produced by the polybacteria, the heart, affects the heart, affects sometimes the kidney, the liver, and then some nervous system causing severe damages. So, Cornibacterium diphtheria is a causative organism for diphtheria. And it is one of the highly infectious diseases spread by droplets through coughing, sneezing, talking, even spitting. And then when the organism gets into the nostrils or the eyes, it settles in the upper respiratory tract Hello, sister. to the formation of a membrane. Yes. yes. Please, it's like your voice is a bit low. Oh, okay. Okay. Please, is it better now? Yes, please. Okay, sorry about that. So these exotoxins leads to damages of epithelial cells, and that leads to the formation of a material which is grayish whitish, what we call the diphtheria and um, pseudomembrane, and they find themselves in the nose, in the pharynx, in the larynx. So let's let's look at this. Sorry, sorry, it's quite a disturbing. So that's another formula. Let's look at it. So mm -hmm. this is the, the throat. This is the throat of an infected person with diphtheria. And then you can see those white, grayish, dirty patches in the throat. Mm -hmm. And you can see it on the tonsils, in the facets of the throat, that arch eh, the, around the oop in the tonsils. Okay. So those are the things that, that they may find themselves there, sometimes even leading to difficulty in breathing in the child. And it is a difficulty in breathing which usually causes them to die. Are we all together, class? Yes, madam. Yes, ma. yes. Good. Let's look at the signs and symptoms. I want to say that the signs and symptoms are dependent on the type of diphtheria. Remember I said it's a highly infectious disease that affects the upper respiratory tract. And in the upper respiratory tract, we will have the nose, the pharynx, the larynx. And so depending on where the diphtheria has affected in the upper respiratory tract, the signs and symptoms would be unique from another one. Now let's look at the first one. This means this diphtheria is affecting the nasal passages. And so it leads to the formation of what's to call a serous and generous discharge. So the child will have a lot of serous and generous discharge, just like in common cold. Nasal discharges will become so rampant, will become very much in the nasal diphtheria. Now, when it comes to the tonsillar diphtheria, remember when we move to the tonsillar, we are getting close into the throat. So in the tonsillar diphtheria, one of the signs and symptoms are that the child may exhibit signs of dysphagia. So when the child is swallowing, even dysphagia on saliva, even swallowing saliva, the child experiences some pain in the throat. Then we also have the sore throat. The sore throat means that when you look into the throat, into the pharynx, you realize that the place is very reddened, inflamed. Then 
you find the patches also over there. Then the cervical lymph nodes may be enlarged. So the cervical lymph, lymph nodes find themselves around the neck, eh, in the neck and around there. So when you palpate, realize that they have become inflamed. And they have become inflamed because they are just trying to fight the infection in throats. Good. Now let's look at the laryngeal diphtheria. Remember when you look at the larynx, it means the larynx is taking us a bit deeper into the respiratory tract. So the larynx diphtheria, one of the signs and symptoms you should see is some difficulty in breathing. So you have the child experiencing signs of dyspnea, respiratory distress. Now that the child will be also coughing and then there is hoarseness of the voice. There is hoarseness of the voice and then there is some stride or noisy respiration as a result of the infection finding itself in the larynx. Class, are you together with me? To ask you. Yes, yes. Uh, so the, the, the signs and symptoms are not so specific. Of course, what types nasal, tonsillar, or it is laryngeal, a lace, fever. But depending on the site, it may come with very specific signs and symptoms to tell us where it is. Again, the laryngeal, you see that there is retraction of the, the, the neck and then the chest. That is because of the difficulty in breathing. And the difficulty in breathing leads to cyanosis. And then there can sometimes be wheezing, noisy respiration. And then sometimes there can be nasal regurgitation of fluids because of the inflammation occurring in there. There may be some regurgitation. Now, I've said that diphtheria can also be found on the That is the cutaneous diphtheria. But the skin diphtheria is not as common as the diphtheria of the respiratory tract. So for the skin diphtheria, what is seen is that you see blisters on the skin, which is affected. And sometimes these blisters may be broken and may be covered by a, a dirty gray material, like um, in a wound with a um, slough, which needs debridement. Okay, good. So this is the diphtheria like I was showing you. So this can be one of the tonsillar or example of the tonsillar diphtheria. So you find it in the faucets of the throat and then you find it on the tonsils. So the throat becomes infected. Good. Now let's look at the diagnostic investigations. For the diagnostic investigations, it may be important to history. And what history do you think will be taken here? What history do you think will be taken here? History. The child, the child vaccine. Child vaccine. Child vaccine. Excellent. Immunization records. Immunization records. So record of immunization. You want to find out if the child has had immunization. Good. That is very good. Then what again? What again? Concerning history. Maybe if you want to find out if there has been an outbreak of diphtheria in your community or if the child is in, you know, these daycare centers. Have you had any outbreak of diphtheria or an upper respiratory infection in the schools? That can also be a good history that we also want to take. Good. Thank you very much. Then we can do physical examination. Yes, Jesse. I see your hand. Yeah, yes, madam. And I wanted to also say that um, you can also ask if they live in a very crowded area too. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. So we also want to find out um, where they live, their living environment. Is it a very crowded room? Because that's where you can have easily spread due to bad ventilation or inadequate ventilation. Good. Then we can do some physical examination. And in physical examination, what are we looking for? So we can look into the throat. If it is a tonsillar, 
um, diphtheria, you find that the whole place is inflamed with that dirty gray patches on the torn cells. Then you can even palpate the cervical lymph nodes to find out if they are palpable. But the most important investigation, which will really tell that the child has a diphtheria, is through taking a throat swab for culture and sensitivity test. So when you take a throat swab, and this swab, make sure that it is not covered by saliva, but really want to take a swab of the throat secretions or even around the membranes we find in the throat for culture and sensitivity. And that will be what will identify as having, you know, diphtheria. Good. Let's look at the... Oh, I want to look at the treatment. Good. So treatment. Treatment. So, so treatment. The fact is... The fact that, that the disease is caused by a bacteria, we can use an antibiotic. So that is where we do the culture and sensitivity test of the throat swab. And then over there, and then over there, we may find which antibiotic the organism is sensitive to. But most of the time, is penicillin and erythromycin, which are used in the management of diphtheria. And because I said the corny bacterium produces an exotoxin, which can cause damage to the heart, to the kidneys, even the nervous system, it is important that we give a diphtheria antitoxin. And this diphtheria antitoxin will neutralize the toxin is just like someone with tetanus. We give the, the antitoxin to neutralize the exotoxins so that it cannot have complications on some vital organs of the body. But then for the organism, what we use to manage it is the antibiotic. Aside these major specific treatments, that is the antibiotic and then the antitoxins. We may also give some supportive treatment based on the special problems of the patient. So you realize that when we were looking at the laryngeal diphtheria, I made mention of the fact that, that the child may have difficulty in breathing. And so over there, we may give some respiratory support in the form of mechanical ventilation so as to take care of the dyspnea, so as to take care of the cyanosis, which the child may be experiencing. And then we also need to isolate the patient. So we talked about barrier nursing. So if you have a facility where highly infectious conditions are nursed, like some of us may have a fevers unit, then it is important that we isolate the child because it spreads through droplets. So if care is not taken, if care is not taken, the condition can easily spread from one person to the other. And so it's important that we isolate the child. Then we also need to take care or we continue to um, put surveillance on people who may have come in contact with the infected child. So if in a population of a school, about three children have reported to have diphtheria. It's important that the child's classmates or even students of the whole school are tracked so as to rule out diphtheria for early treatment. And then we'll talk about the fact that there is also a need for active immunization. You see, immunization takes away all things, prevents the infection. So that if the child is immunized, it will give some form of immunity to prevent an active infection. Now, let's look at complications of diphtheria. So I told you that the exotoxins which are produced by the corny bacterium can affect several vital organs of the body. Now in the cardiovascular system, 
it can cause myocarditis. That is inflammation of the myocardium, the innermost lining of the heart. And as myocarditis occurs, this can lead to abnormal heart rhythms, what we know as arrhythmias or dysrhythmias. And if a, a child is having abnormal heart rhythms, it can even lead to shock and the child can be lost. The respiratory system, it can lead to respiratory failure, even for the laryngeal diphtheria, we talked about the fact that apnea, dyspnea, wheezing, and then cyanosis. In the kidneys, it can cause tubular necrosis. It can also cause some form of proteinuria and that can further cause severe damage to the kidney. On the neurological system, it can cause palatal palsy. The palatal palsy is the regurgitation, the nasal regurgitation of food. That can lead to aspiration, and then it can lead to death. We can also have some damage to some key nerves. So the ocular nerve can be damaged, which can lead to some blindness or some form of visual loss. Then it can also cause um, damage to the cranial nerves. And so sometimes if it's not even taken, it can cause a lot of um, inflammation of several nerves. That is polyneuritis. And that can cause motor deficits, making it difficult for the child to even walk because of the damage which has occurred over there. Good. And then let me look at the last complication. We'll talk about it and we can close for the day. Good. So most of the complications are what actually leads to death. Typical example of what leads to death is respiratory distress. Of course, if the baby cannot breathe, then vital organs are also getting oxygen and that can lead to a physiological malfunctioning and death can occur. So when you talk about diphtheria, I said it used to be one of the highly infectious infections we had in most low to middle income countries. But today, with the advent of vaccination, we do not even see cases of diphtheria, though it may be there. There are times that we have outbreaks. They come and then goes away. Okay. But it is not one of the regular infections infections we see in this part of our world. And it is caused by the chronic bacterium diphtheria. And it's usually a respiratory tract infection, but it can also affect the skin. The signs and symptoms of diphtheria are not so specific. Depends on which part of the respiratory tract it's affected. Is it a nasal diphtheria, the tonsillar diphtheria, is it a laryngeal diphtheria? Depending on the site, the unique signs and symptoms that the child will be. We said treatment is all about the use of antibiotics. So antibiotics to destroy the bacteria, and then we use antitoxins to neutralize the exotoxins which are produced by the bacteria. And these exotoxins causes damage on several major organs of the body, such as in the nervous system, on the heart, in the respiratory system, they can be damaged and that can lead to death. Good. So prevention is about vaccination. The primary prevention is all about vaccination. As the child is being vaccinated, the child gets some kind of uh, immunity or boost from suffering from an active infection. Good. Any question or contributions? Is there something I've said you want better, further clarification, or you even want something to add to what I have said. Hello. Hi. You guys, you guys are sleeping. <laughs> are you guys sleeping or what? No, no. sister. No. Good. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can call it today. And one of your colleagues asked me about the about the med -sem. and ah. I said I'm the Google form together. I'll let you have it. And then you so maybe a maximum of thirty questions for your thirty percent of the assessments. 
Okay. No routine. No routine. Uh, yes, yes, madam, please. I want to know whether there can be an instant where a child can be immunized with diphtheria and still acquire this uh, the vaccine. Whether a child can be given the vaccine and still acquire this diphtheria disease. Okay, good. So it's very possible. You know, for immunity fakes, so I say immunity fakes, you know, even when we had COVID-19 immunization, there were times we had to go in for booster doses. So there can be situations that the immunity may fade and then a child may develop diphtheria. Good. But if you look at our um, immunization program, <clears throat> diphtheria is given about three times in the whole immunization program. Okay, so all is supposed to enhance to boost. But yes, someone who may have even had all the three can still have an active infection. Just that the immunization has reduced the incidence drastically. You see, if I am immunized, I cannot get an active infection easily. And so you realize if someone is even infected and we are in the same room, we may not all suffer from it. And so at that point, we are kind of cutting through the cycle so that the infection will not spread from one person to the other over and over again. Then they will have an outbreak of diphtheria. Please, Nurudin, are you answered? Uh, yeah. uh, yes, um, I'm saying this because at our local facilities, we, we, we go to realize that the, the drug storage is very poor. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. that, so sometimes that, the vaccine that, they, that, they that store it and, with the cold yeah. chain. The cold chain was not maintained. Okay. We did not maintain the cold chain. So at the point, the vaccine lost its efficacy. So even though we had given the injections, the children were not given any kind of protection against this. That can be one. And like I'm saying, with time, immunity fades. Even though you may you may be immune today, as time goes on, it may fade. And then the kind of resistance or ability you had will not be the same. And then you can have an active infection. Good. Thank you very much. Yes. Any other question, please? Sorry, Any other can't. question, please? Any other question? Okay. So if there are no questions, I would like us to end here. Um, when I start with the next topic, we can't finish. So let's end here. I think then we can end there, going through all what we have done. So I wish you all the best for the rest of the weekend. And I wish you even much more goodness and mercy in the next week ahead of us. So just take care and all the best. Thank, Thank you, man. God bless you so much. God bless you too. God bless you, man. God bless you.